Edgecombe County is to take over that gap funding from the city of Rocky Mountain. That's a big thing. It's going to start July 1. It's a huge budget driver for us as a county as we're preparing our budget for next year. Um, also starting July 1, Nash Rocky Mountain Schools is to be named the Nash School Administrative Unit. That was specifically put in the legislature. Um, Nash Rocky Mount Board cannot file legal action against Nash County uh, regarding funding for uh, 10 years. It started when this, uh, when, this, when this became legislation, so that will run through fiscal year 2027. And um, if Edgecombe County fails to provide the required funding, it will trigger um, a county line merger. It goes into some detail about the mechanism to make it happen, how we do that, redistricting, and all of that. So those are the main components of uh, Session Law 2016-14. So out of all of those things in there, the two uh, with the biggest bu budget implications for us now um, is the second and third, and that is us provide, uh, providing our portion share capital and us taking over that gap funding for, uh, from the city of Rocky Mountain. So I want to talk about that first one. So, so far, the only new capital improvement that the uh, Nash Rocky Mountain School System has brought to the table was they did some repairs uh, to a building at the Nash Community College campus for their early college, and we had to share in the cost of that. Our share was just under $83,000, and that was all finished up last fiscal year. So far, that's the only thing that has been brought to the table, except, as I'm sure everybody's familiar with, there is a plan to build a new school in Reddit. It's elementary school, and my understanding is that their plan is to consolidate three schools into the one school. Uh, right now, their total projected cost is $20 million. $10 million of that is coming from lottery funds. Other $10 million will come from local funding. And so uh, Nash County plans to do a borrowing to cover uh, the, the cost of that $10 million. And right now, we don't know exactly what our share of that will be, uh, what that, our share of that debt service will be. It will depend on um, the terms of the loan. But we expect it to be somewhere between one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand dollars annually to support uh, this new school that's proposed to be built in Reddit. So it's uh, it's sort of open ended at this point. The timeline for them starting that new school, I'm sure you know most of you and all of you have you know read articles in the paper about their discussion on building it. Um, uh, we expect that. Uh, it likely will it will not hit our budget for next fiscal year, but it could if they uh, if they speed that process up. Um, but that, that's still undetermined. Second thing regarding current expense, and I want to just real quick show you a little math as to how that that gap in current <coughs> expense is calculated. So this is the formula for uh, current year gap payment, and so. It basically just take Nash County's uh, current expense appropriation to Nash Rock Mount School System, a little over $20 million. Um, then they look at the number of students in the school system from last year's num or the previous year's numbers. And simply divide that, it comes up to be uh, a little over $1,500 per computer. <coughs> Then we look at what Edgecombe County's appropriation is for current expense to Nash Rocky Mount Schools. Uh, divide that by the number of students from uh, the previous year's count, 1670. That's what our per pupil allocation comes out to be. So the difference between those two is a $255.85 gap per pupil. And then just taking that number and multiplying it by those 1600 plus students. And so the City of Rocky Mount's uh, gap payment this year is $427,000. That fluctuates some each year. It depends on what the final budget appropriation <coughs> is, what the number of students were the previous year. But it has always been consistently somewhere around $400,000 uh, plus or minus. So that's what Rocky Mount is paying this year. And about this is what they will not be paying next year that Edgecombe County is going to have to cover that difference.
And so those really are, are the two main things that we are staring at right now um, is those capital costs as well as the gap in current expense that we're going to have to start preparing for this current fiscal year and following years. Um, so I, I want to be brief in my presentation, just be kind of straightforward, give you an update, some background on that, happy to answer any questions. Any questions for me? Somebody? So this is kind of our current overview. 
If the current students in Rocky Mount would join us at BCPS, um, we'd have to begin, so we've begun some development and options um, for exploration with our community. Each of these draft plans that you'll see tonight um, provides Rocky Mount students with high quality, innovative learning experiences, which minimizes the impact on our current ECPS community and cost to the county. So again, as you're thinking and looking at these scenarios, think in terms of our current staff, our current schools, uh, the capacity that's in those schools, and how that might impact if we um, have about 1,800 students join our, our um, community. We believe that all of Edgecombe County students deserve an excellent education, and we look forward to this planning process. So again, the emphasis is if this happens, when this happens, we have to plan. We can't just jump into it. We can't do it quickly. We've got to plan out what, the, what will happen and how this needs to happen. Um, I will stop just for a quick second here, and I want to just kind of give us a little bit of um, feedback on some of the things that we're doing. So I um, just want to take a minute, and I want to highlight some of the successes that we have experienced since our last meeting together. So just a couple things, and I could do 10, 20, but just, I'm going to just hit four or five things. So we've had IBM, um, and we had several professionals come in, and they stayed with our county for 30 days. So IBM came in, um, they did some data analysis with us, they helped us set up kind of a tracking system. Um, and again, why do I say that is important? We are the only school system in the nation that they've done that with. They selected us based on the data, based on the things that we've done, based on our innovation and our openness to want them to come in and support us. Um, Stocks Elementary School, we've started a STEM lab there, um, and we are, that's something that we feel like is important for our students. We are starting slow, but we have gotten a grant for that, and we started that STEM lab. We've rebuilt Princeville Elementary School um, right behind us, and we've also rebuilt the Professional Development Center. Last year, we had a micro school um, that was housed at North, but it was Phillips and North students. This year, we've taken that micro school and kind of expanded it into North Phillips School of Innovation, and those ninth and all ninth and tenth graders experienced that same um, type of schedule that they had for the micro school. When we think about some of the pieces that we're talking about, um, it took a significant amount of time to make those things happen and to make them run well. Uh, we learned a lot from that, but we also learned from if we go too fast, we don't get the best results. So again, I'm sharing this story as in where we are currently in Edgecombe. We're on the rise. We're moving forward. Um, as our curriculum folks will come up, they will share with you data around our schools, and you'll see some improvements that have happened over the last three years. So here's um, current status concerning Rocky Mountain. We would be adding nearly 1,800 students to our school system. This is <coughs> equivalent to a small school system, okay? The four Rocky Mount schools that we're talking about, they have currently a letter grade of F. Now, we have some F schools as well. We have two out of 14. In the past, if you look at our data, we've had more than that. We've continued to pull our academics uh, data in a positive manner and move us along. So this would add four schools that are currently a letter F, a great left letter F, according to DPI. Third bullet, we propose a minimum of 12 months, ideally 24 months for this transition period to occur and for us to get it right. And then the last bullet, students already enrolled in Nash, Rocky Mountain Middle School or High School would remain in their schools until graduation. So again, this is a proposal. This is something that uh, we thought would be best, the best way to transition in if that's what we decide we need to do. Okay? And then again, <coughs> just sharing some of the, and what, we, what I mean by success stories here is we've had some changes that we've made in our school system and just want you to kind of bring you back to this uh, Martin Millennium Academy. So that's a local school, an immersion school. Um, we started that process, and what it did in that second bullet is it eliminated some transitions from Tarver High School feeder pattern. So if you recall, um, Stocks was a pre-K-3, Tillo was a 4-6, Martin Millennium, Martin Middle School was a 7-8. And so we did away with that when we did when we implemented Martin Millennium Academy. When we implemented Martin Millennium Academy, which is local school, it took us about 18 months to make that happen. So we went to other school systems, 
Um, we've been to visit other schools that have had a global um, perspective, and we did the research and the study behind it. We saw what they did that worked well. We saw what we needed to do to, that worked well. So the, again, these things took us some time. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't in 30 days. It wasn't in six months. It was about 18 months. We had many um, community meetings where we talked to parents, we talked to the community, we talked to students to see was this the right thing to do for our, for our community. North Phillips School of Innovation, that was about a 12-month process that we went through, um, through the transient where we learned um, what did this need to look like, how is this going to benefit our students. So again, it takes time to get it right. Um, and then the ECPS design cohort, that started this year. We have about five schools, and what they're doing, doing is they're working on how to redesign their school so, to make it better and to support students and give them some additional options in learning. And again, it's a process. So this will take us about a year or two, two for this to come to fruition. And then when we see Princeville STEAM, we know that rebuilding Princeville took some time, but we didn't want to rebuild Princeville and bring it back exactly how it was. We wanted to bring it back better. So again, time matters. Um, having planning time and the proper funding to make all these things happen work for us. Okay. Um, you all have shared, Eric, um, you've shared a little bit of this, but I just wanted to stop here so you saw some of the numbers. Um, elementary, middle, high school, Tar River, what that looked like, how um, we got to the 1800 students, and which grade levels it composed of. So I'll stop there and just give you an opportunity to read it. Now, when you think about um, 1,700, 1,800 students being added to our current enrollment, that's an increase of about 30%. Um, so we are a little under 6,000 students, so that would be an increase of 30% students joining our, our school system. At the bottom, these are some of the um, kind of primary costs for planning. We feel like we need one additional person to help lead this change. If we're adding 1,800 students, they don't just come in. We need to make sure we're planning for those students. So are we going out meeting with community members? Are we meeting with community leaders? Are we having focus groups with parents and students and staff members once we know this would be in play? So that would take some time while still learning our current school system. So that's why we said an additional person to help with that. Under that, you'll see um, travel for installation <coughs> visits. So we want to make sure if we're going to add 1,800 students to our school system that they don't just come in and necessarily just blend into everything that's going on. What are the needs of those students? Um, what impact do we want to make sure that we have on their life? Um, do we, what are some things that we want to do to assure that they can have a positive experience um, in Edgecombe County? At the bottom, you'll see the community meeting costs curriculum purchases for the coming year, um, because some of the purchases and curriculum pieces we already have in place, that's for the 14 schools and the about 6,000 students that we currently have. <coughs> if we add 1,800 students, there's some other curriculum materials that we need for those students as well. And then at the bottom, with the consultant and the contract fees, there are other pieces in, and um, studies that we want to do, again, to make sure we get it right. Um, this is a heavy lift. And we want to make sure that we do it right and that we do our best work. Um, and so again, taking the time to plan and making sure um, that we're, we're giving them opportunities that they deserve. Here are some benefits, um, or possible benefits. So with the benefits, there's some possible cost savings with maintenance, utilities, some personnel. Um, everything would not have to be replicated. So there's some things that could overlap. Um, consolidating our op some of our operations now, um, possibly repurposing some of our buildings, aligning instructional programs and vision, increased community involvement, increased student achievement. So again, these are things that we would have to work through and figure out how do we make this happen. Um, but again, everything doesn't have to be duplicated when we're adding 1,800 students. But there are some things that would have to be, so there's a possibility of some, of some savings there. Um, and we would <coughs> explore that further. And then the cost of not having adequate planning, right? 
Um, so rushed implementation, um, continuously shifting the paradigm, um, renovating buildings that may ultimately be repurposed. So again, if we don't have proper planning, we may go in and we do an upgrade on the building and then we figure, figure out, well, the best thing is not to house students here. It would have been better to select this other place to house students. So us having time to really study and figure out which building is the best, which one has the least cost, um, which will hold students, um, which one have the facility needs that we have for certain programs that will be in schools. So again, these are some of the things that you rush through if you don't have the proper amount of time um, to plan today. And then here's a kind of a timeline. And if you look at the, the first number is the timeline if it was for 12 months, for one year. So you see the 3, 6, 9, and 12. And the second number is if we have 24 months of planning, the 6, 9, 12, and 24. And so under each, um, it talks about developing the timeline. So thinking through what are the things that we need to make sure we do, kind of backwards planning to get ready for students to join us. Um, assess our operations, so again, looking at buildings, looking at facilities, looking at our programs. Begin some research and empathy interviews. Um, in the research that I've done, um, formal and informal conversations with leaders in both ECPS and in Nash Rocky Mount, there's not been any conversations with parents, with students, to talk about what are your needs. Um, and this directly impacts them, but no one's had any conversations with any of them, and that's bothersome. Um, and so for us as a district, that's just not how we want to do business. So if we're going to, you know, if this is going to happen, we want to make sure we go out, we meet with families, we meet with students, and we talk through what are the things that matter to them and how can we make sure that they can reach their passions and their dreams. And then the last one under three to six months is to begin the design process. So again, it is slow. But we believe in doing it right. Um, and, and there are going to be some missteps. But if we don't have the time to do it, there certainly will be some. And some of those missteps are pretty expensive. Under six to nine months, some of this is continuation. So continue research and empathy interviews. Continue that design process of what do we want school to look like. And then begin recruitment. Um, because you're 1,800 students, there are staff members, there are principals, there are teachers. Um, child nutrition, their bus drivers, we have to recruit. Um, so one question always has popped up in our minds, so what about the staff members at Nash Rocky Mountain? They wouldn't necessarily stay with Nash, um, would you say Nash Administrative Unit? They wouldn't stay with them. Um, what does that look like, right? So again, we still believe in recruiting, not just a passing off. We recruit, we interview, we select, and we hire. Um, but that will be the beginning process. And then the 9 to 12 months, we continue that design process, begin building, renovation, repurpose planning. And that repurpose is really around our buildings and our facilities. What do they need to be used for? What's the best method for us? Um, and then again, that 12 to 24 month, that's when K-6 or K-9 scholars begin the year as ECPS students. And we could add to that K-12. Um, but again, when you see our scenarios, we've used the scenarios of K-6 through K-9, um, and these would be rising K through 6 and rising K through 9. Uh, we just really felt like moving students while they were in high school and asking them to come to a different high school was unfair to high school students and difficult. Um, we don't know if that will you know, pass muster, but that's where we, we felt like we had to, at the very least, start with K-6 or K-9, and not to, to, to dismantle you while you're in your high school career, okay? So here is projected Rocky Mountain enrollments, and I'm sure several of you have seen this. Um, it shows elementary schools, Baskerville, D.S. Johnson, Fairview. Those are the three that have the heaviest numbers. Um, if you see the total at the bottom for elementary, it's 912. For middle schools, J.W. Parker, uh, 224 students, but you see at the bottom of middle schools, 330 students. And then for high school, Rocky Mount High School, you see 397 students. And at the bottom of high school, you see 475, and you see Tar River has 19, and that's their alternative program. So this is showing the enrollment. Uh, it, yes. What does this mean that uh, our children from 
the edge from the side of the building, plus to not central and not the northern end. Yes, so those the numbers that are there yes. indicate so the plus, other schools. Been plus, I would rock them out into the county school system. I don't know if they're being bused, but that's, that's where they that's attend. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I highlighted the big numbers, right? right? Okay. But there are 54 for Nash Central, there are 8 for Northern Nash, there are 16 at the Early College, and there are 19 at Tom River Academy, which is their alternative program. And then you see um, corresponding numbers for elementary and for middle. Um, I highlighted in the lighter color, and, and forgive me, the Ben Benu don't count that one. Those are the three elementary schools that we would acquire. And then J.W. Parker is the middle school that we would acquire. Okay? So again, just wanted you to see the numbers, see what that looked like, um, just so as you're kind of processing through, that, that made sense to you. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. just a point of interest, if you'll know, right over the elementary school, we have one. Yes, one. If we're still there, we're holding to build a new school. Mm -hmm. The problems that we have. It does indicate that. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next few slides, um, these are the scenarios. So, again, I will talk you through these. Again, these are possibilities. There are so many possibilities, but these were just four um, that we thought through. So the first scenario talks about four different situations. Early, early Childhood Center, and the reason why we wanted this, these are possible school structures. We wanted that Early Childhood Center because we really believe if we have some early interventions with students who are struggling academically, that that is healthy. Um, we also did a K-2 school because, again, we wanted a real keen focus on that early literacy, that early learning, um, and then a 3-H school and then at the bottom you see existing ECPS high schools. Because remember in our head, the scenario was at most K-9, so rising ninth graders. So those ninth graders would join our existing ECPS school if we only had ninth graders. Now if it's the 9 through 12, which is on the table, then we would have to adjust. And that we will address that in scenario four. So again, scenario one is just talking about possible school structures um, and avoiding multiple transitions. If you look at scenario two, <coughs> it's showing two pre-K-8 schools. So we would take two of those school, two pre-K-8 schools, and it could be um, in the schools that they, the four schools that they are, um, that would come to us, and we would create two pre-K-8 schools. And then we'd you know, funnel into our existing ECPS schools. So some would say, well, why would you want a pre-K? It's fewer transitions. Um, if we look at research, we know that when kids stay in a school longer, they build relationships with the teachers, they feel more comfortable. Um, if there are some issues or concerns, you're more likely, I have you longer, we try to fix those issues or concerns. If you are moving frequently, I don't get an opportunity to do that. Um, and that's why we've changed from Patillo, um, Stocks, and then Martin Millennium having those three transitions before they even got to high school. Um, so we want to mimic some of the things <coughs> that we've already seen that have worked in Edge Company. Scenario three, you'd have kind of a traditional setup, pre-K through five school. And again, you see the number three, that's how many schools, three elementary schools that would come to us. And you see the six, eight middle school, you see one six, eight middle school. And then again, for high schools, they would join our existing ECPS high schools. Scenario four. So there, scenario four is would be district realignment for elementary and middle schools. When Mr. Williams gets up and shares, he is going to share with you um, our school capacities, what our current schools in Edge Home can hold, and what the enrollment is. So you'll see um, if there's some space there, what that would look like, and if that would even make sense. So he'll share that with you. But again, scenario four, we would have to realign elementary and middle schools. And then we would assign Rocky Mount students to current ECPS schools, and then existing ECPS high schools, the, the students for high school would come into um, our current high schools. So those are the four scenarios. As uh, others come up and they share kind of their overview of finance, maintenance, 
they will have some of this lens, but they will tell you kind of as they're going through what assumptions they're making as they're talking through their data. So again, um, school structures, some scenarios for us to think about. These are not all the scenarios. We could come up with 20 other scenarios. These are just the <coughs> And then other items for consideration. Um, and this list, again, could go on. Uh, we have a Google Doc that we've just put all the thoughts that have come to our mind. This is just a small, small snapper. Um, transportation costs, travel time, the efficiency rating, when you think about transportation, athletics, 6 through 12, Nash Rocky Mount staff, those that would not stay with them, an alternative program currently we have an alternative program, would we need to have an alternative school? Um, maybe, maybe not. Child nutrition costs, onboarding for staff and students. Um, if you've been in Rocky Mount school system um, and you're joining Edgecombe County Public Schools, we feel like we need to have onboarding for staff, students and staff and kind of uh, reacclimate you to what we're doing in Edgecombe, how and the why. Um, community meetings, we need some focus groups. Consolidation of our schools, is that something that needs to be on the table? Is that something we want to think about? What makes sense and what the <coughs> school board members from Nash Rocky Mount, um, they currently have some members. We'd be having a, a large node of their population joining us. Um, what happens with our current school board members for Edgecombe and then what happens with Nash Rocky Mount? And then last, school construction. Because on that side of the county, we have three elementary schools, one middle school that would become ours. Um, also, Mr. Williams will share there's a trial nutrition warehouse and there's a um, teacher professional development center that will also be a part of, of this um, merger deal. But there was not a high school on that side of the county. Um, and when you go further in, um, and he'll share with you the capacity, could we even fit those 400 students that we currently have into our schools? Could that even happen? What would that look like? Um, what kind of concerns would that cause for us? Those are things we need to think about. Again, so time matters. Um, and us thinking through what's best for our kids and, and how do we make those decisions that matter to us. Again, no conversation has been had with parents and students. And so we feel like that's not okay. This is impacting them. So we would have to start with having those conversations and doing what's right and what's best for kids. Okay? I'm going to ask Ms. Cottrell and Ms. Thompson if you don't come on. in terms of schools that met or exceeded growth and schools that did not, you'll notice that we've made great strides, right? So we've gone from eight schools who did not meet growth to three schools who did not meet growth. But I have to say, Tarver High School was one point away. So we're going to go ahead and count it for this year. Um, and then 2017 to 2019, we went from four schools who exceeded to six schools. So we're on an upward trajectory, very important, um, which is very important in this context. Um, so also keep in mind that uh, four of the schools that we may possibly inherit are not only F schools, according to the North Carolina School Performance Scale, an F school is a school that receives a, a performance rate of 0 to 39. So those schools are ranked at like 30 to 33. Right? So it's very, it's, it's not impossible, but just things like that could possibly be what we're inheriting. So when it comes to instruction, it is difficult sometimes in terms of number to numbers to quantify costs, but we just want to give you some um, projected costs that we have discussed and thought about in various meetings um, under the assumption that we are operating all four schools in Rocky Mountain. Right? So that would include um, additional costs for reading and math curriculum. And we're not just talking about like supplementary and ancillary, ancillary material purchases. 
Um, for example, we have a K-5 literacy program called Benchmark Advanced, so that will require, again, purchasing the professional development in addition to um, the materials. Um, no nonsense nurturing, which is behavior management, that would be a training, additional materials. Um, we have invested in the social emotional curriculum. We know that's a, a, a lot of our students experience trauma. That's a big part of learning because we know kids don't learn well if they're hurt or hungry, right? So we try to um, address whole child needs. So that would be that those curriculum costs and then, um, as Dr. B mentioned, um, additional materials and supplies. I'm trying to keep to my minute of slide now. When it comes to personnel and other professional development costs, um, we talked about streamlining. So again, um, Rocky Mountain, you'll hear Mr. Williams talk about lock systems and Rocky Mountain lock systems in Edgecombe County, whether or not they match well. Rocky Mountain school system, they do instruction a little bit different than we do. So trying to streamline and make, making sure that new staff, not just Rocky Mountain staff that we may um, acquire, but all new staff that are on the same page with that. Um, we're asking for an additional reading specialist and math specialist. I do want to to again come back to um, the four schools that are in dire F status and we would require and need that intense support of those students in order to bring those schools up to par. So in trying to support those intense supports, we're looking at an additional reading and math specialist, um, two culture and climate specialists, and in terms of testing and accountability, um, an entire uh, position for power school which handles testing and accountability. So we really want to think about not splitting, having to split the support that we have for our schools because that's helping us to continue in a positive direction. Um, but what additional supports will we need in order to bring those other schools up to front? Um, if you do not know, Edgecombe is probably a one-to-one -one student device district. So then that comes with additional um, technology costs. So we're looking at another school technician, um, a digital learning coach for those schools. In terms of um, infrastructure, additional access points and servers, phones, subscription services, so that would mean like internet, phone services, our file library system, um, and then any additional student devices that we would need to purchase because at this point we don't know what we would get, what kind of condition it would be in it, and if we have to make any additional purchases. Uh, I'm going to now turn it over to Erin. Erin, we're doing a minute this slide. Yeah, this slide, I got it. You got it, um, So, um, as I mentioned earlier, my job title is Director of Innovation. So my job is to come up with the wild and crazy ideas here. So um, we are also excited, um, if this if these schools um, become part of Edgecombe County Public Schools, we'd be excited to talk with the community. Like Dr. Bridges mentioned, we feel like this is really critical that we would engage our community, um, engage parents and students to get their input and feedback on the types of learning experiences that they want for their children. Um, as we've been considering that, we've also been thinking about some of the research we've done over the past five years as we've redesigned our schools here in Edgecombe. And some of these ideas, I think, could potentially apply um, to this work in Rocky Mount. So uh, we've seen some 612 residential schools um, in some communities that have been um, highly effective. And so that's an idea I think we want to explore. Um, certainly redesigning the alternative program, as Dr. Bridges mentioned, for our students here in Edgecombe County and, and the students in Rocky Mount. Um, considering a blended learning secondary school, an opportunity for middle and high school students maybe to have a non-traditional learning experience, um, certainly providing comprehensive mental health supports. Um, we know that that is a need um, here in our Edgecombe County Public Schools, and um, we, we certainly understand that our, our Rocky Mount students also deserve that type of support. We've talked a lot about school coaches and how can we um, add additional capacity to our principals and our teacher leaders as they're in the process of designing learning experiences for kids. And then finally, you know, obviously back to, to what I said to, to start, we want to get that input and feedback from the community and then really dig deep and research those suggestions and, and take seriously that input from the community as we're making design decisions um, going forward, hopefully over a year or ideally two years' time, um, as we engage in this process of bringing those students into our district. We have any questions? If you have none, I will turn it over to Mr. Williams. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, my staff and I had an opportunity to go to the building uh, last Monday. Um, they did not allow us to take any photos. 
Um, we could walk and go in every room or every room that they, they, um, they are available to us. And one of the first things we look at, um, we're going to talk about capacity. Um, Bullock, the actual occupancy that we have there is 658. That's what we're supposed to. But we're over because it says it's 711. All right, and you define occupancy or capacity with DPI by the amount of programs and different um, programs you offer in the building. So let's just say a, a school has uh, carpentry, and that's calculated into the DPI uh, capacity. But if you take carpentry out, then you lose like seven seats because you took that program away. So yes, we could get a seat for the child in that building, but DPI is going to define that as we lost seven seats because we removed that program. So when you start removing like CT, like uh, masonry, electrical, carpentry, uh, home ed, it takes away from your overall building capacity according to DPI. Now, of course, again, your um, total um, uh, occupancy in that building would be higher, but in DPI standards, your capacity just went down. So these are some of the numbers here. We're at 658, so we're actually over. Do we get paid for, from DPI for occupancy or capacity? Uh, now that would be a lower theory. We get paid based on average daily membership, so the number of children. So. No. All right, uh, Corporal Wimsey, we're at 257. So there's on there's, uh, two nine, that building will hold 294 according to DPI. So we actually have 37 seats at that in that um, facility. Um, GW Carver, 587. Uh, but the total capacity there is uh, according to DPI, 710. So you have 123 seats roughly in that building. Uh, Princeville, 179, but you, we have 258 uh, according to DPI, which gives us 79. Stocks, 496, <coughs> but we have space for 518, which gives us 22 extra seats. <coughs> All right, um, this is some of the buildings um, that we toured. D.S. Johnson was the first one. It was built in 1960. Um, it has about 65,000, almost 66,000 square feet. That student capacity there is 601, but that's based on it being used for eight grades from um, three through five. Um, it has a cash value of roughly around $9 million, but if you look at deferred maintenance on the building, it's $5 million in deferred maintenance. And what I mean by deferred maintenance is like the capital projects that need to be brought up to date for each building. So each building has a tag that was done by an independent study, and this information is available on the uh, Nash Rocky Mountain website under their uh, capital improvement plan. So they totaled up at $5 million. Um, now I talked with their maintenance director. He walked us around the building, uh, told us. He was very upfront and honest about a lot of things. And one of the things he told us was this building needs a new chiller which, you know, is almost a half a million dollar project to redo for a whole school. Um, and other things, they had access control, which is the swipe access that's installed on every door that leads outside of the building. Uh, one of the big ones is the multi-purpose room. Uh, needs, the floor needs to be abated and replaced. When you're talking about abating, you're talking about asbestos. So the floor tile is popping up. So if the kids use that building, you have the potential for the actual dust particles of asbestos being um, coming active in the air. So that's one of the things they're going to work on this um, summer. <clears throat> also, they, they have, don't have ADA compliant bathrooms, which is for handicap access. So that's going to be a big issue. If you get a kid in a wheelchair and you know they make a complaint about not being able to go to the bathroom with the grab bars, then you open yourself up for potential liability issues. Um, parking lots need repaving. Windows need to be replaced and abatement. The um, glazing around the outside of the window has been tested positive for as <coughs> Fairview Elementary, this one was built in 1997. Uh, it's 49,000 square feet. This one has a capacity of 450 kids, but it's only K2. So um, it's, a, it's valued at six million. But this one, they have done a little bit of work to. Um, but they only have deferred maintenance in this one of about half a million. Um, they completely renovated the HVA system. Um, they put access control all over the building, but they did not repair the roof. So that is a big issue because, you know, once your roof starts leaking, it causes other problems in your building. Um, it needs a lot of carpet replaced. When you walk in the hallways, it smells kind of musky. And he was honest about it. And that's where that musty smell comes from was because of the fact that the carpet being so old and dated. Baskerville Elementary was built in 1957, 53,000 square feet. It'll hold about 427 kids if you use it for K grades, K through 5. And it's valued at about four million, but if you look at the deferred maintenance, it's at three million. So they really haven't done a whole lot of work to this building. Uh, this one here needs a new air conditioning system. 
Uh, it does have access control. It does have a full metal roof on every building on that um, campus. But it also needs new carpet. There's a lot of potholes in the parking lot. It needs new windows. The they windows do leak. They had some of the windows taped up um, to keep them from falling over. Uh, it needs an electrical service upgrade. As we continue to add more and more technology to our buildings, it puts a, a low demand on our um, electrical service. So you start having breakers trip. You know, you have the Chromebook cards, you plug up one or two of them in one hallway, then you're liable to lose power on that whole hallway because of the load demand. So it needs a uh, new electrical service, and it also does not have ADA compliant bathrooms, which is another issue. J.W. Parker, this is the larger of the four schools. Uh, it's built in 1961. It's about 130,000 square feet. This one holds about 557 students if it's um, Slated to hold middle school six through eight. It had, does have a cash value of, of right around eight million, but it still has about a little over two million dollars worth of work to get it up to DTI standards. Now they did put a new gym, they did remodel the gym, put a new gym floor in, new bleachers. This one also has access control. They did start painting some of the hallways. They replaced some carpet, but not a lot of it. Um, it needs a new chiller system, so that's another big ticket item that we would possibly take on. Um, the windows are positive for asbestos glazing, so that's another issue that we would have to address at some point down the road. Um, parking lot has not been touched. Um, holes all in the, um, in the parking lot, the lines have not been striped. Uh, we also need to do the electrical up service uh, upgrade to this building as well. Um, he did say they received complaints daily on the power tripping in that building. And this one here has some ADA compliant bathrooms, but in the gym area, there's none. So that means that we would have to, you know, our locker room stuff would have to be upgraded as well. So we're looking at total, a total of about $11 million in deferred maintenance. Yeah. Yes, sir. Would you really say that the school has been neglected? <laughs> I, I would say so that, money, that money should be appropriated to the age gone county side of the track before anybody take other control. <laughs> it has. I think some of the stuff that has been uh, the big ticket items has been left off on purpose. I would say because I mean they didn't. I don't think they knew what was going to happen. So I, I can't speak for Mr. They knew uh, what was going to happen. They just won't make plans to make sure they don't get nothing out of it. So we get that out of it. That's crazy. So there's $11 million in deferred maintenance on these uh, four buildings. Um, in addition to that, we'll need more maintenance staff because most of our guys stay on this side of the county. So we would have to actually add additional people to uh, maintain these buildings, which would actually end up being just one in every trade, but three in the ground department. Uh, we need a new H uh, HVAC technician, a new electrician, a new plumber, and a new hardware. Uh, there's about 35 acres of grass area that needs to be main cut and maintained. So we would need additional staff to maintain those grounds. Uh, we also need somebody in our, in our maintenance office, in addition to the lady that we have now, to help with inventory because it's going to actually it's going to go up considerably. Um, we also would gain the teacher resource center, which is like a professional development center, and the child nutrition warehouse. The child nutrition warehouse has three coolers and a freezer, pretty large area. Um, they store all their dry food in that one warehouse, and that would be part of the deal as well. Uh, the Teacher Resource Center used to be the City of Rocky Mount Operations Center. They've totally remodeled that building, and so there's nice technology inside of that building. But the conversation I had with the director, I think some of that technology is going to be removed before we get it. So I don't know how that's supposed to work, but that was the conversation he and I had. Um, we also have to think about cleaning the building as far as custodial staff. Right now, this is what they have. They have two full-time, two part-time at Baskerville. There's two full-time, two part-time at D.S. Johnson. Fairview Smaller School, it has two full-time, one part-time. And then Parker has three full-time and one part-time because it's the largest of the four. Here's some of the considerations for maintenance. We have a keying system. Our keying system is totally different from what they have. So we would have to potentially get their, all those bills, all six of them, re-keyed by a master locksmith um, to the ECPS key system. And if you think about school security, let's just say we keep data, but we don't know who has keys to it. 
you know, because if they say, well, you just take this, this is ours, it works. It does work, but we don't, we have no way of maintaining who has access and who does not. Other than on the door to have the swipe access control, but every door, you know, if you have a key on it, they can get in, even with swipe. Um, security cameras, you know, we have to be able to get them out of that system where they can't log in and continue to monitor what's going on or be able to make them go dark so that people can do what they want to, you know, as far as going in and out of the building. Uh, there's a potential, there's potential for that. Um, well, there was NASDAQ Rocky Mount door access control merged with ECPS. We have access control on our high schools right now and the early college. Will we have to buy another license for each one of those buildings or will it merge without? I don't think it will because it will be installed by two different companies, but that's also something we have to take over and maintain. HVAC controls. We control our air conditioning from our laptops at the office. So if you call and say you want the heat on, we can turn it on without having to come to the building physically. Ours is Johnson Control. Theirs is, he wouldn't tell me the company, but it's not Johnson Control. So that's another licensing issue that we're going to have to purchase for six more buildings, which can get fairly expensive. You're talking at least five to six thousand dollars per building, depending on how many phases they have inside that building. Um, new maintenance vehicles, because if you add more staff, we're going to have, have to add more vehicles, especially lawn equipment. And furniture and technology, the um, PD center that they have, is nice and renovated. It has nice furniture. That's where they hold all their principal meetings. I don't know if they hold board meetings, but I know they hold all their principal meetings there. And it was mentioned that that furniture would be removed prior to it being turned over. I don't know how true, but that's just what he said. So that would be a big cost to us to furnish that building. Any questions? So, Ms. Leary and I would like to take a few minutes to share with you regarding the finances, finances and the staffing pattern. So when we look at staffing and funding considerations, we're yet again working through the assumption that Edgecombe County Public Schools will continue to operate the three elementary schools, the one middle school, and then receive uh, the high school students into our current high schools. So with the core staffing projections, we're looking at just that, the core. We're not looking at an exhaustive list of staff, but the essential staff in order to keep the schools moving forward and in operation. We want to talk with you this evening through three different categories. Category one being uh, the administrative positions, category two being the certified teaching positions, and then category three being the classified positions, which are non-teaching positions. Um, we'd like to also share that on the next three slides you can see dollar amounts attached to those positions. Um, but at the end, you'll see a slide that's going to summarize all of those costs and what side and compare it to what may be the state allotment for those costs and positions. So when we look at core staffing for elementary schools, the students in grades K through 5, the number that we're focusing on yet again is 912 students. With the three categories of staff looking at school administrators, we would maintain three principals, a principal for each of the elementary buildings, three assistant principals. Looking at certified teaching staff, we would maintain approximately 58 classroom teachers, and that would be spread over the three elementary schools. Six enhancement teachers, which consists of your music, your art, and your health and PE. School counselors at three, media coordinators at three. Looking to the right-hand side, when we talk about classified staff or those non-teaching positions, yet again, we will have a bookkeeper for each of the elementary schools, a school data manager for each of the elementary schools, seven teacher assistants, because teacher assistants are allotted or allocated uh, based on kindergarten classrooms, and then custodians, as Mr. Uh, Williams just shared with us earlier, six full-time, five part-time, for the elementary schools, which translates into 8.5 FTEs. 
staffing for our middle schools, grades 6 through 8. The number that we're looking at yet again is 330 students. When we look at the three categories of staff, we would maintain one building principal, one assistant principal, for certified teaching staff, looking at the classroom teachers at 14, the enhancement teachers, which again would be your music, your art, your health and PE at three, one school counselor, one media coordinator, and then looking to the right of the slide, the non-teaching positions, which would maintain one bookkeeper, one data manager, an in-school suspension coordinator, or restorative justice, as we now call them oftentimes, at one, and then custodians at three full-time, one part-time, which translates to 3.5 FTEs. And then lastly, looking at the high schools, this is based on 494 students. We talked about the 475, which would be in the traditional high school setting, and then I think it was approximately 19, which currently are in the alternative program or alternative school in Nash Rocky Mount. That gives us the number of 494. So those three categories of staff, school administrators, you'll notice that there is not a principal listed because they will blend into the current high school, but there's an assistant principal listed at one. Certified teaching staff, looking at our classroom teachers at 18 to help accommodate our high school students. Enhancement teachers at five, school counselors two, and then non-teaching positions, the school bookkeeper would not require an additional position. Uh, the school data manager would not require an additional position. And the in-school suspension coordinator would not require an additional position. So on this slide, we're attempting to take those estimated costs and compare it to a projected amount that we may receive from the state allotment for those number of students. So we summarized all the elementary, the middle, and the high school um, into that. Now, as a reminder, as you heard me say, you know, um, Ms. Chairman, we, we Williams asked about how they receive our funding. Most of it is driven by AD and the average daily membership in the school. And some allotments are different than that, not all of them that way. So, and in some of those allotments, you know, we receive our funding in many different categories. And some of them are funded through position and months of employment allotments, and some of them are a dollar allotment, which means that you have to stay within the number of positions no matter the cost. You don't have to worry about the cost of them, you stay within the number of positions. A dollar allotment means we have to stay within those dollars. So the first one you have here is a principal. So if we were estimating four principals at 418000 the state will give you 12 months of an allotment for a principal for any school number we have. So if we have four school numbers, we would receive four principal positions. On the assistant principal, however, we're looking at five possible APs at 414000 The state doesn't allot you one AP for each school number you have. They allot you one AP based on um, 98.53 students. So the number of students that we have would earn um, 1.55 of a position with APs being employed for 11 months. So that would fall short by 3.45 positions. On classroom teachers and enhancements, they fund that by positions. So we calculate it based on, it varies by each grade level, how they calculate those number of positions. That would equate to about 83. Based on the scenario we put together, we would be short 21 classroom positions. Counselors and meteors are also funded by a position allotment. We would be, um, based on the numbers we have, we would generate eight positions for that, and we are estimating 10, so we'd be short to it. Non-instruction support, I've lumped those bookkeepers, the data managers, the custodians are all in that non-instructional support allotment. So in all that, it was 21 positions at an average cost of um, Use an average salary of so $9.27, and the extra funding we would receive would be $4.57 with a shortfall of $470,000. But as soon as I say that, I will also qualify that to say that these um, number of positions we've estimated by school is without digging deeper into those children and really knowing more um, information on them. And I also have not considered at this time any um, type of impact on the wealth allotment nor our admin student allotment that we traditionally use for clerical support and assistance and things of that nature. Okay. So just a few other additional staffing considerations for us. 
looking at the school level, uh, once again, the original numbers that we shared with you was not an exhaustive list. It was more the essential. But looking at the school level for certified, as Ms. Betrayal shared, when we look at curr curriculum specialists, the needs for supporting students who are coming from schools uh, with an F, um, that would be something that we would certainly need to dig deeper into. Student support, uh, such as school nurses and social workers, looking at our special populations of students, which is often like a fluid number. Uh, how many students would we have to qualify for the Exceptional Children's Program? How many students may qualify for English as a second language? Uh, how many students might we have that would qualify for academically intellectually gifted programming? Also looking at CTE and uh, JROTC staff. When we look at the classified positions, uh, as shared earlier, we would need to take into consideration the child nutrition staff needs, uh, looking at custodial staff, as Mr. Williams shared with us earlier, looking at bus drivers, looking at uh, instructional support, what additional clerical support may be needed. And then last but certainly not least, what uh, staffing considerations may there be at the district level, such as the technology technicians, as Ms. Betrayal referenced. Uh, with the devices, we would need support to keep those up and going. Human resources support. When we look at the teachers uh, who may be hired, uh, who may fall into the beginning teacher support program, how do we support uh, that particular cadre of professionals? Central office clerical support, maintenance staff, and finance specialists. Do you have any questions for um, those, those numbers, were they based on what employees in Edgecombe County Public School or inmate or national recommendation? Um, on the calculations for the salaries, I, I used for the um, classified the average salary that we have in Edgecombe County Public Schools for the certified. I used the teacher salary scale um, out of step 20 range. So that would be true for any student. Any other questions? Any questions for me? And that's a moving target, right? So the number of seniors this year, last year, and next year is not going to be the same. So those are the targets. Um, so even if we got the numbers for this year, if it didn't happen this year, we'd have to look and say, okay, the year that it would happen, those would be the number of seniors we have to look at. Okay. So last, mm -hmm. any other questions? Okay. So last slide. Just a quick summary, and again, you've heard from curriculum, you've heard from innovation, you've heard from maintenance, uh, finance, and HR. Just um, the plethora of things that would have to happen. You haven't heard from transportation, child nutrition, uh, we haven't heard from our principals or our other staff members about how this might impact them. Um, and so for us, we've got to, you know, this is one of the many meetings that we'll need to have, to ha have about this topic. Um, but I will go back to our ideal for students to remain um, as they are in Nash right now. The next best, BCPS would need 12 to 24 months for planning to get this right. And then the bullets that are under that, um, these are things that we think are important. The community engagement, we again, we feel like we have to talk to parents, to students, to teachers, that this would impact directly. Um, school structure, so you saw those four scenarios which one works best for us, and then how do we make sure that's the right thing for our students after we have those empathy interviews and talk to parents and, and um, students. Exceptional learning experiences. We don't just want to bring in 1,800, 1,200, or 100 students and just do business as usual. If you pay attention to what we do in Edgecombe, we want the best for our kids. Does it always happen? No, but we're striving for that. Um, so you see innovative practices happening. Um, sometimes it's in small numbers, and then we build out from there to get it right. Um, and then resource determination. We have to make sure we're using our resources wisely and we're doing the best things for students. So that's, again, um, our summary slide. You've heard from many folks who are working on this process and thinking through it. 
they're doing that along with their current job. And so, and when you saw that slide that said, we would need some additional hands if this is where we're moving to make that work in 12 to 24 months. Again, because they still have to continue to run edge home county public schools, the 14 schools that we have. Um, and if we're going to experience that type of influx, we have to get it right. We don't want to rush it, but we have to get it right for our kids. Questions and feedback, um, and I will say for our staff, um, many of them, there are many questions that you may have tonight that we just don't have the answer to, right? Um, these are assumptions, they're scenarios, nothing's written in stone. We don't know all the answers, but we're willing to, to hear your questions. Um, and if we need to get back together to address the questions that you have, we will be glad to do that. Well, I, I guess I can be, I thank you, this is a good beginning in terms of uh, what the board needs to know. Um, what we do know is that we've got legislation that is going to require us to um, do things uh, for the National Academy of School System that we have not done. What we also know is that none of the capital improvement money that we've sent to the National Academy of School System has gone into the educational side of Rocky Mountain. That's right. And what we also know, if we continue as we're going, the schools in the Edgecombe County system will continue to, in the Edgecombe Rock and Rock will continue to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. That's what we do know. That's based on the history of what's presented to us. Our board has, our board here has not taken any official action in terms of, of, of what would happen. What we do know financially is that it will not happen this year. Okay. But I think we need to charge the, the school board or the schools board and the staff to continue to work on the possibility of this that this could happen. I personally, this is just me speaking, we cannot continue to do build schools in the Nash County school system uh, but our children will not attend continue to pay for them. And that price is going up. It's continuing to go up. Um, so, as I said, uh, our board has not had a discussion. We do know that we have to, there is a triggering mechanism in this statute. Okay? Okay. So, regardless of what we do, it will be in compliance. Okay. Okay. As I look at it, okay, as I look at it, okay. My attorney looked at me when I said that. <laughs> but, uh, but that's what I think it reads. Okay, I'll retract that. Is any comments from our board, any of our board members in terms of what we have heard? I have a couple of things. Go um, ahead. Uh, I know that the numbers, especially on the northern end of the county, doing a little more, those numbers um, I wanted to know had you or the board started thinking about what you would, what the cost of maintaining those schools with those low numbers? So we have had some discussion, but not with our board. Um, specifically, we talked about the numbers. We certainly have seen those numbers, the dwindling, um, and that's a concern. Um, so when we were talking about some of the um, revamping, that may be some possibility. Um, we certainly can pull those numbers for each of those schools, Coulter, Phillips, and more, and see what that looks like. Um, if this comes into play, I think that is something that's on the table for further discussion. Of what does that need to look like and what, what makes sense? Um, because sometimes it doesn't make sense to maintain as we have so far. So we may have to look at that. And I'm really concerned about broadband down that area. Mm -hmm. You had any more students. I already can't make a call when I go to film. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. You really can't make a call. <clears throat> so our students are not getting what the other side of the county is getting that far. Sure. So broadband is something we would really have to work on before we can add any more students to any more technology down there. Right, and we're aware of that problem. So our, our director is making of, of technology. He is working on that <coughs> process on like how to eliminate some of those concerns. Um, we won't speak to that tonight, but that we are aware of that and trying to alleviate and fix how can we make this better, and sometimes that support has to come from outside. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ms. Wilson, 
I wanted to know, has um, the school board talked to anyone about the possibility of redistricting funding within the school district? In the next few years? No, we have not talked about redistricting. But if this happened, that would create. If this happened, that would create. 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 That would And that's why we showed you the numbers for the actual enrollment and capacity. Um, because that would, you know, that would possibly generate some movement. Um, and again, that scenario number four is, would be realigned and redistricted a lot of from our school system that we currently have. I saw, I heard the, the need for uh, three schools over the age coming down the side. Would it not also include a renovating of the two high schools, Northern, North, and uh, North Tower and Southwest, if we bring in more high school students? Say that again, I'm sorry. If, if there was a need, if there was a need for all the students to come back to Edge Cone County, would that mean you would have to renovate the, two, the three high schools? Is so, that a company? so I, I'll, I'm not necessarily, but I'll leave that to Mr. Williams. Um, Northwood it needed because it has the uh, the size to was to sustain about another 150 to 200 kids. Um, Southwest would. Um, Tarbell High would not need anything additional. We probably would have to move like the um, what's the program Hope. Mm -hmm. We would have to move if we were to like move them to another building. <coughs> it could handle, but North would not need it. Those of us on that side of the town think we need a new school on that side of the town. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about things that other things that we have to completely work out in terms of where we uh, spend our money. Uh, what, we, what I do know. Is tech education and welfare a part of common responsibility? Mm -hmm. And right now, um, the education of our children, especially those are in the Rocky Mountain system, not even getting the capital improvement, and, and we have failed. I wouldn't say fail it, but we have done the best we can. We as a board have provided that, but we have fallen short in terms of our funding, but we have funded what we thought was good budget wise. And we have to do a better job in terms of prioritizing uh, where our funding is moving. And we think we're going to get there. We think the potential growth that we see for our community, that a lot of things that have not been happening, we think that financially we're going to, we will get there. And I'm hoping to see a lot of things happen that maybe has not been happening for our county. Those of us that know what things are going to happen and have been working hard to do that. But I do think this was a, a needed conversation. We need, we need to start a public <clears throat> conversation on it. Mm -hmm. And I think your plan of action in terms of we need community groups that we need to talk to, we need to talk to the parents, we need to, because it's not going to be as easy to say it can happen, mm -hmm. because there's going to be a lot of some resistance to that too. Because I've been here all of my life and I've never gone through the Edgecombe County School System because there was a Rocky Mountain school system, okay? And those of us that came up <coughs> in the Rocky Mountain school system. And so a lot of those things have to be worked through. Um, any other board members have anything to say? This is not my need, this is our need. <laughs> no. um, but we do that with us without an objection. Some, some of our elected officials and others from yeah. Rocky Mountain. Mm -hmm. And, um, Thank you, good evening. Thank you so much. I'm Ruben Blackwell uh, with the Rocky Mount City Council and have been on the council since uh, 2000. And um, tonight in our meeting, um, we've had public comment and we continue to have it. It seems that the public is just awakening to the understanding that this is taking place, which is unfortunate. And I can say for one that several of us in Edgecombe Rocky Mount have been advocating for years for appropriate investment in the physical plants of these schools that are located in Edgecombe Rocky Mount. We have not seen it. We have continually been told by the Nash County Commissioners that appropriate investments are made 
and I for one appreciate hearing the level of benign neglect that has continued for years that our children have had to live in. And to me, this speaks to the level of priority that has not been placed on children that live in inner city communities in Rocky Mountain. And if you won't fix the building up, I have no confidence that you even cared about the children who are in the buildings, much less the staff and the other professionals that work with the system. And um, we have, at the city council level, been active investors for years in this collaboration between all of our elected bodies. And we have advocated for continual collaboration. And I, for one, um, am more impressed by what I've heard tonight about the structure, the level of priority that Edgecombe County Public Schools have had on the placement of resources and your approach towards education and physical plant capacity than I have seen in others. And frankly, and I know this is, might not be politically correct, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Priorities have not been placed on students who live inside the city limits of Rocky Mountain, both Edgecombe and Nash. And I just have to say that. Because when you look at all of the schools within the city limits of Rocky Mountain, with the exception of Rocky Mount High School, which we paid for a tax increase in Edgecombe County. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we were promised by <coughs> Nash Rocky Mount and Nash County Commissioners that that investment would stay in Edgecombe County Schools and it helped build a high school in Rocky Mount Nash County. And all I can say is, I for one am not pleased with what I see. I hope we have sincere and serious conversation. The Nash County Commissioners shackled Rocky Mount City Council's hands in investing, continuing the investment in this partnership. We were willing to pay the difference for Edgecombe County per rather share for ADM, and we were shackled while the rest of the General Assembly passed laws that said it was appropriate for cities to be involved in school systems. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, we need some reckoning of what's appropriate public engagement and some conversation about what we're all going to do together. And I appreciate um, the fact that, and I say I because I'm joined with my fairly new council member, Richard Joyner, and uh, what we have contended for years is that this has been sabotage mm -hmm. for Rocky Mount to not be as competitive as a city for young families that are growing and investing and looking for places to live. And all I can say with the recent activities that are phenomenal within Edgecombe County and Rocky Mount City proper, um, this is a wonderful opportunity to begin looking at how we plan forward. And I would advise us to not look at things in silos anymore, to not just say, this is the county's responsibility, this is the city, this is the school board. It's all of our responsibility to build communities that people can live in, that children can prosper in, and they can go to school and be healthy and have a great education and want to live in our community. So thank you for allowing me to talk. I know my councilman might have something to say. I'm not assuming I take all the air out the room. But um, I, want to, I want to thank you for we having this conversation. And um, I just say, don't play, please. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's not play politics. Let's do what's right for our kids and our communities. And we'll support you, sir. Thank you. I just want to ditto what Councilman Brewer said. And it continues that we are doing listening sessions in our ward to hear what our citizens are saying and hope that we can expand our listening sessions to invite you to come in, to sit with our residents, to hear their concerns as we move forward. Just thank you for what you're doing. Uh, I consider myself. Um, Tarboro, Edgecombe County, even though I'm in Rocky Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> you have our support. Yeah.
I would ask if our school board members, any of you have any questions at this time on any topic we've discussed tonight. I want to thank you and your group, Dr. Bridgers, for not only looking at the dollar signs tonight, but to look at the school system of children and students. I mean, I, I think that's what's what we've missed in the equation. And I think that's the most important thing to put forward. And if we, if we put those children first, then everything else is going to fall in place. <coughs> uh, I want to ask a question, Mr. Reed. Did, 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 was there any conversation about why, and I, I just call it negligence, on the schools on this side of the track that they were telling you what the repairs were needed for and what the conditions of the schools were? Was there anything that they would say that gave you any, any, any idea why it wasn't done? His, his words to me were that it wasn't on their prioritized list that they come up with um, as a district. So that means the children will be making. Yeah, it's, that, it wasn't on their high. It wasn't. They have. They come up with a prioritized list yeah, each year, it and it always it, something always trumped it. I'm, just, try, I'm just trying to get my gun loaded. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but yeah, I, I, I'm just serious in some what you have reported to us. That's the bottom line. That the schools on this side of the track are neglected. <laughs> Correct. Which means the students have been neglected. Correct. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, may I add a citizen? Without uh, an objection from the school business. No. Uh, for a I'm wrapping Roseback Higgs, and I want, I'm going to put a different spin on this whole equation. And Wigan, you said you never attended a school in the county. I never attended an immigrated school. School immigrated the year after I closed. I mean, after my school closed, but I saw the kids make the transition, and it is what it is today. I'm very, very disappointed, y'all, that this bill was passed in 2016, and now we're talking about six months before July the 1st, and everybody wants to come with what I consider excuses. We haven't met here. We haven't met with that group. What in the hell have you been doing for three and a half years? We know the bill was, you know the bill was there. Y'all agreed to the bill. Y'all agreed to, to four year delay. So this, this board did not agree to this bill. But what I'm saying, y'all. I don't, I don't intend to get an adversarial role with it. Y'all sit in the room, anyway, the bill passed. So when I said the bill has sit dominant for four years, Y'all know it was coming. Matter of fact, y'all should have known in 90 when, it, when your marriage and it was coming. So I think you ought to thank the Lord that you got away with it as long as you did. Those kids on the Edgecombe County side of that track, they're Edgecombe County students, just like the rest of them. What I don't want to see happen is just how those schools are F-performing schools, that those kids get labeled coming in to the Edgecombe County system. It's not fair to them. It's majority of them are black. So y'all need to find a way to not try to stir away and blame Nash County for conducting their financial responsibility. Edgecombe need to step up your game and do a better job at serving the damn people y'all for be representing. I'm wait, wait. No, I'm done. Those are my comments. And I'm talking to every, every elected official sitting around this table. Well, you just joined last year. Uh, you've been there for 20 years. Y'all saw all of this coming. And you did nothing to, to try to uh, prepare yourself for it. And, it. and it's a shame. You got to learn to be proactive and not continue to react. And you've been sitting on a bill for four years and coming here tonight and act like you got to go do this and do that. It's a shame. Uh, the intent of our meeting tonight, uh, the bill is what it is, and the bill, the school system can remain as it is. So there is no immediate action for this board to take. The reason for this meeting is, is that if in fact it does happen, uh, that our school system can plan for it to happen. It might not ever happen, okay? So that is the reason for this meeting. In terms of our obligation to the children in the Edgecombe Center, Rocky Mountain, we have fulfilled those obligations. We, the county, 
we, the school board, has fulfilled those obligations in terms of the funding required. All of those obligations. So none of what I have just heard is the truth. But well, when you on the board, when you on the board, when it went in place in nine one, you out of order. You out of order. I'm out of order. You out of order. You I'm going to ask you if you remain out of order. I'm going to ask you to leave. If you remain out of order, I'm going to ask you to leave. No sir. Okay. No sir. You have no other comment in this meeting. Well, it'll be an opportune time. You would, you would have no more comment in this meeting. Right, it'll be an opportune time. It won't be this meeting. I respect, I respect this yes, meeting. Yes, sir, please do. But y'all ain't through that. Hold it. Ain't through you still are on I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to have to take any other action. Now, you're good. You're good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. But this is not the end. This is just the beginning. Well, we can have them there. Okay. We will have them there. Okay. Right. Okay. Is, is there any other comment? I want to no, in, uh, Let me have I just want to commend Dr. Griffiths and the staff for pulling together the data. Because if you're going to fix something, you got to start with the end in mind. And the numbers and figures and everything that you got is so nice and comprehensive. Anybody could understand it. And thank you so much because now, you know, the, the planning of it, it takes a lot to do what, where, we, where we are. This is 2019, 2020. And I, I really appreciate those figures. And I, I, I grew up in the Edgecombe County School. It's amazing to see the things that have evolved and the things that we've got to be accountable for. But we've got the right data, and we got a place to start. So if we start with the end in mind, which means to make every child champion and successful for the global society, you started us with what we need, and we can all sit together and begin to start finding ways to make it happen. Thank you so much. Donald Bridges, I think your report takes back, okay, in terms of the fact that you're researching. I think this is an extra start. This is not necessarily an emergency. It's to prepare us in case something does happen. Is there any other business to come before this board? If not, I'll take a motion for my board to adjourn. Questions? All in favor, let it be done by the other side. Aye. All opposed, there's none. Just that one. I would like someone on our board to <coughs> offer a motion to uh, close this meeting. Second. Uh, has been moved and properly second that we will end this meeting. Any other discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed to the same sign.